live, I guess. Okay, I'm getting the live button, so I'm going to welcome everybody uh, to this truly unique experience. Uh, my name is Lisa Laflamme. I'm from CTV National News, and it truly is an honor to be here and welcome you all to this special virtual fireside chat. Uh, I wish we were all in person, but thus is 2020, so we have to just uh, accept it. Um, but we're focusing today on resiliency in the Canadian military, and today's chat is hosted by True Patriot Love, Canada's leading foundation supporting serving members of the Canadian Armed Forces, veterans, and so importantly, their families. Um, I will be the moderator for today's discussion, so I'm going to thank you for, for joining us on this special online event. This week marks uh, Mental Illness Awareness Week, an annual national public education campaign that the whole goal of this is to bring awareness to the reality of mental illness and most importantly, to end the stigma that is attached to it. That is just such a, an ongoing effort and, and a heavy lift, as we all know. Um, so many military members, veterans and their families have, have successfully managed service-related challenges like mental illness. And we're going to talk about some of that today. Um, today's chat will provide valuable insight on navigating difficulties through the lens of Canada's armed forces. Um, October also marks Women's History Month, so we are also celebrating the achievements of women, so we have so much to be proud of today. Um, the fireside chat today is in honor of Captain Nicola Goddard, and um, she was such an exceptional young woman who I had the pleasure of meeting and, and interviewing during her tour in Afghanistan. Um, I, I've interviewed a lot of soldiers over many tours in Kandahar and Iraq, and Nicola uh, was memorable, not just because she was a rare woman in, in a combat role, but because she was a, a truly inspirational leader, unassuming, intelligent, and, and with a great sense of humor. Um, and we know where she got that because I know her parents are on the line. So I feel like Miss Betty, I can see Tim and Sally and Prince Edward Island and Kate in, in British Columbia. But, um, you know, Nicola, her platoon loved her and that means so much. And I'll never forget where I was standing the day my phone rang and I was told that Nicola had been killed. Um, she was Canada's first woman soldier to die in combat, and she was only 26 years old. So we honor her today. And uh, I just, her beautiful family has kept her memory alive all these years and again today. Um, earlier this year, True Patriot Love launched a podcast called For Her Country in Captain Goddard's memory to serve as a platform to showcase exceptional women in the Canadian military. Uh, it's an amazing podcast and a journey, truly a journey. So I want everyone to be aware of that. And I know there's over 500 people listening in on that. So on this um, fireside chat today, I didn't have a fireside to show you, but I do have this Canadian art behind me. So, um, so resiliency, as I said, is the key theme throughout the podcast and it's going to be the theme today. Um, so over the next hour, we are going to hear from three inspiring women you see on your screen from the military community as they share their perspective on resiliency and provide key lessons from their experiences managing adversity. Um, as I said, we have people joining us from around the world. We have received so many thoughtful questions in advance. I'm going to try my best to get at them, but I want to introduce each of our guests now, first of all, uh, Rear Admiral Rebecca Patterson uh, joins us, enrolled in the Canadian Armed Forces as a critical care nursing officer in 1989. She has deployed internationally to Saudi Arabia, Somalia, and Afghanistan. Uh, she was awarded the Meritorious Service Medal for her contributions to the mission in Afghanistan in 2014 and was inducted as an officer in the Order of Military Merit in 2018. In July 2020, Rear Admiral Patterson was appointed to command Canada's Canadian Forces Health Services. 
named the Canadian Armed Forces Defence Champion for Women in 2018. Rear Admiral Patterson continues to serve in this capacity. She is also the interim LGBTQ2 and Defence Champion. So we welcome you, Rear Admiral Patterson, to this morning for this very important chat. Uh, retired Captain Mary Ann Barber joins us from Nunavut this morning, born and raised, though, in Sault Ste. Marie, so she's used to that cold weather, um, joined the Canadian Armed Forces in 1997. You're rolling your eyes, Marianne, I can see that. Um, she spent almost 21 years as a critical care nursing officer and deployed to Bosnia-Herzegovina in 2002 and 2003 and completed three tours to Afghanistan between 2005 and and 2008. She was medically released in 2018 for post-traumatic stress disorder and she is currently working as a nurse practitioner in British Columbia and as I said Nunavut uh, where she joins us. So Marianne was also a guest uh, of the podcast for her country this summer and just a riveting conversation for Marianne. So great to have you with us this morning. And Marie-Andre Mallette, so great to have you with us as well, a registered nurse with 15 years of experience in psychiatric and community care. Prior to receiving her nursing degree, Marie-Andre worked as a social worker with marginalized groups. She is a proud mother of two young boys and the wife of a Canadian Armed Forces veteran who has himself battled post-traumatic stress disorder and suffers from physical injuries. Uh, she has been involved in advocacy work since 2013, sitting on one of the advisory groups of Veterans Affairs Canada. Uh, she and two other military spouses also started the incredible, incredible foundation Caregiver Brigade. It is an online platform that provides information and links to families dealing with PTSD, such an incredible resource and contribution to the conversation, Marie-André. So great to have you. Thank you to all for being with us today and for your service and support to this country. Um, we probably don't say it enough, but we owe you such a debt of gratitude for all that you've done and all that you do. 2020 is the year of the nurse and midwife. Uh, and that's a positive. We need to find some positives in 2020. So that is one of them. Um, so recognized as our frontline workers through this pandemic. And we're pleased to recognize the vital role that you all play as, as nurses. Uh, and as I say, particularly managing the global pandemic. So I want to get right at it now. Uh, with our questions. If you have, if you want to jump in, just raise your hand because Zoom is not exactly as cozy as a fireside chat. So we'll try to warm up this um, cold technology. So we're going to start and, and I'm going to ask you, uh, Rear Admiral Patterson, and if I can call you Rebecca, you tell me. I don't want to break any military rules here. I know what happens when when that unfolds. <laughs> what kind of challenges, I want to start with you, um, in your opinion, are faced by those who serve in the Canadian Armed Forces? It's a broad question, but can you zero down for us? Can, and of course, please call me Rebecca. So I think if we start in the context of the world, um, it's a very dynamic world that we live in. It's complex in things that impact all members of every country. And it's also very volatile. And it's gonna remain that way for the foreseeable future. When you think about our current situation with the pandemic that's, that's dramatically affecting Canadians and the rest of the world, like there's nothing that doesn't touch every citizen. So who is a Canadian Armed Forces? Well, we're, yes, we're members of the world, but we also uh, belong to an organization that uh, definitely works in that domain of chaos. And so, what are the challenges for members of the Canadian Armed Forces? Well, when you think about it, we have careers that are defined with constant change, whether it be changing jobs, change in the work that we do, or even changes locations that we live. And then you throw on that the extraordinary things that we ask members of the Canadian Armed Forces uh, to do, to go to places like Afghanistan, um, to work in long-term care facilities where uh, we actually confront things that most Canadians can't imagine. And then, then you add to that, we, we move away from our families, things that give us stability and, and normal support. And so um, 
it's a dynamic and exciting lifestyle, but it's one of the reasons why when we talk about mental health and resiliency, um, understanding the context in which Canadian Armed Forces members work and live and create relationships is quite important. And we do all of this while kind of embracing this vagabond lifestyle. Thank you, Lisa. Right. Vagabond lifestyle is such an interesting way to put it uh, and, and so true. And to your point, you are members of the world and the global military um, voice. Really, this is a side of it today that we don't talk that much about. We talk so much about the conflict and these sorts of things. Marianne, Barber, I want to bring you in on this same question. Um, the challenges that you faced, you were a young woman when you first um, signed up. So give me your perspective through the rear view mirror, if you can, on the challenges faced by those in the uh, Canadian Armed Forces. Thanks, Lisa. I agree with uh, the ma'am. I mean, absolutely. It's this kind of uh, constant change. There's one certainty in the military, and that is this always changing environment. Um, and there's almost this like forced adaptability because it's certainly... Uh, is kind of sprung on you. There's a whole culture that is being in the Canadian forces that is nothing like what you find in, in the civilian world. And so, you know, you go from, you know, somebody telling you what to wear and how to do your hair and how you're supposed to act and, and, and perform and you have to conform into this new world. I remember being, you know, I joined, I was 20 years old and I had already done a year of university and thought I was, knew what I was doing. And then all of a sudden I was in the military and I was like, what is this? What do you mean I can't do this and I can't do that? And it was, it was really interesting and a challenge. And you adapt and you conform and you, you move through it and you're doing it all together with another group of people that are all going through the same thing at the same time. So, but the constant change and this new culture is definitely a challenge when you first start. And you say all that with a smile on your face. And I know that there were some great challenges for you personally. So we will dig into this, but I mean, I think it's so critically important also to mention that the challenges faced by those in the Canadian Armed Forces are also faced by their families. And Marie-André, I want to bring you in on this part. I don't want anybody to forget that when a soldier has PTSD, basically that travels through the entire family system. So give us some perspective from your vantage point on the challenges. Well, challenges for us were more um, upon discharge and when we had the children, it was more adapting. You know, I'm a civilian, but he was not. So adapting to real life was something that, uh, for one, was very hard on him. And after that was adapting to real civilian life with uh, mental illness uh, was something else. Then um, we see the challenges also uh, uh, with raising the kids. He's very much still militarized into this disciplinary manner with the kids where I'm more a gray matter mom where, you know, we do things, uh, we wing it. But at the same time, this capacity of adapting ourselves to many, many different scenarios is, makes us stronger, I feel. Um, because we're, we're, you know, when something happens, I'm the one that will be, you know, like a cat and go back on my feet and go start running whether some family would actually just go into crisis mode and it would be a catastrophe. So it made us stronger. Of course, it's different. It's, it's never going to be normal. But uh, PTSD, we haven't let that define our family. Um, we just continue at adapting and, and going on. You know, they said, uh, they say in the army, uh, adapt and, and, and overcome. It's, 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 you know, what we go by every day. So. Mm -hmm. I want to stick with you on this. You know, you're the tiger mom. You've just given me a new one, gray matter mom, which I think is, is an awesome <laughs> term. And, you know, we throw the word resiliency around so much, especially as I say this year, we are a resilient nation. Women are resilient. We, we are always saying that. But from, from what you've experienced, where did that resiliency have to really kick into high gear at one what moment your soldier husband comes back and is clearly suffering um, severe PTSD? Uh, where do you what moment do you point to to say I need to I need to overcome this? I need to be stronger right now. 
So for us, it was the diagnosis came and fell about a year and a half after his last tour in Afghanistan. So it, it was, you know, not right after coming off the plane. Um, but what when it kicked into gear, as you said, was when we had our second baby and uh, it was uh, it was two o'clock in the morning and you would have massive, massive panic attacks. And I was alone with him. He's six foot four, 240 pounds. And we had just had our second newborn baby. I was sleep deprived from having the baby and him that didn't sleep. He was um, paranoid. He was, you know, overly anxious. Um, and that's at the six month mark when you go for the vaccines for the baby. I just, you know, we had the vaccines and then I asked the doctor, I said, this needs to stop. We have to sleep. Um, this was the breaking point where I said, okay, we need to, um, get better and this needs to stop being in this swirl spiral where we were just going down um, and that was the point where he started getting better where he accepted you know therapy and 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 you know it was and then we just went on positively about you know everything that we were live, living so but it's it's uh, you know every day is a challenge I don't we don't hear uh, you know tomorrow's tomorrow yesterday was gone and today is today and that's how we manage to um, go with everyday challenges that brings us so. Marianne does this resonate with you what you're hearing from Marie-Andre you were that soldier. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly I know for myself, I was diagnosed, I started having symptoms in my, in my last deployment and, and kind of was like, I don't understand what's going on. How am I having flashbacks and nightmares? And uh, why am I getting triggered by these smells? Like, I love my job and I love what I'm doing and I believe in this cause and I am surrounded by a team that I love and adore. And I really, I, I didn't want to come home from Afghanistan. I could have stayed there and worked in the hospital the whole time. And I, I didn't understand what was happening to me. I, I kind of had an inkling, but I was like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm safe and I'm, you know, I'm happy. I'm enjoying this work. And so when I came home and started having issues and I was diagnosed, you know, fairly quickly, like within a year of my last deployment, um, you know, it kind of took me by surprise. And I now, you know, years, like a decade later, you know, I'm really at a point where I identify, you know, some days I'm going to have good days and some days I'm going to have bad days. And I, I do the same thing. I look at that was in the past. What did I learn from this? What am I doing today? And how do I prevent this from happening tomorrow for myself, even for my triggers? And it's a kind of daily maintenance record. I, I don't think PTSD ever really goes away, but I think you learn to manage it differently. And that's certainly an active part of my life now. And Rebecca, I want to bring you in on this. And your thoughts as you as you listen to these two stories and, and also I want to know from your experience leadership role in this critical care area if there's a difference between how men and women are willing to accept PTSD in a way we have to accept it in order to move on from it what are your thoughts on that well, I, I mean, I have to say, I can't tell you if there is a particular difference between men and women and how they handle it. But what I can maybe focus more on is, is things that come within the culture. We have a culture of strength in the Canadian Armed Forces. We want people to be strong. We want people to be willing to uh, um, uh, go into adversity. And we value that. We award that, we give merit to those, those characteristics. So when we talk about uh, being able to actually step forward and seek help and seek support, um, men and women are challenged. Uh, and part of that can be influenced by the culture within which they find themselves. And it's kind of one of the reasons why it's absolutely critical from a leadership perspective that you're creating an environment where even though you can be strong and you can be valued, that, um, it, that there is space where people can step forward and seek support and actually say, you know what, I'm not okay. And I really need to, I need help. And then also like trying to, to make sure that as leaders, we're, we're noticing when things are not quite, not quite clicking or something isn't quite right in, in the people that we work with so we can help foster them getting them into care. 
because as Marianne had said earlier, one of the, the pieces that I love about my career in the military is um, it's, it's a family. We, we create a family. Our strength is family. And so while sometimes that can be a challenge and a barrier to speaking out, to seek the help that you require, it can also have a very protective effect. If you, if you have people who know the signs to watch for and leadership who supports people stepping forward. I think that explains why Marianne said she didn't want to leave. I mean, it's sort of the same for journalists who cover war. You feel like nobody's going to understand when you go home so you stay where you are because everybody gets it. And, and Rebecca, I want you to follow up on that because you mentioned that the, the critical mess of all of this is finding space, giving space to this. How far has the military come and been forced to come through, let's just talk about our role in Afghanistan in those um, 12 to 14 years how far has the leadership come in understanding that this is real and this is something that needs to be handled and helped for the, the troops and their families? Yeah, well, I think you can take this even back to the end of our time in Bosnia Herzegovina when we actually had inquiries that looked at mental health. And, and remember, we are part of Canadian society and the whole of Canadian society coming to grips with what is mental health? What is stigma? What is mental illness? And uh, obviously Afghanistan rapidly pushed forward that agenda. And um, I've been serving since last century. And uh, I have to say that there's been a dramatic change in the programs that are offered. And instead of it just being sort of uh, the downstream when someone is injured, uh, that there is treatment there, it's now a full spectrum of prevention that's uh, available. And I'll even start about leadership philosophy and, uh, and focusing on teamwork and creating um, that battle buddy cohesiveness, creating environments where um, um, misconduct of any type is uh, intolerable or address, whether it be hateful conduct, sexual misconduct, that we're putting uh, extensive effort in both leadership training as well as addressing and dealing with it and then we talk about training. Well, you know, you can throw training at a lot of things, but what's, what's actually effective? So it, it's, about, it's about your spectrum of your life. Let's, let's stop these uh, um, assaults on our mental health starting uh, from the first place. Let's have a look at uh, strengthening the forces training program where we can look at, um, uh, you know, managing um, addictive things, uh, looking at nutrition. And I got to kind of put a real spotlight on something that I think the Canadian Armed Forces has done very well, and it's the Road to Mental Readiness Program. And this program is used in other places in Canada as well, but developed by the Canadian Armed Forces. And it's a routine part of training, repetitive training, where we give tools to help soldier sailors and aviators become more resilient and to manage and cope with stress. And within there, we talk about um, if you're not okay, seeking support. And, uh, and then if, uh, as Marianne has been through and many others, including myself, is we have um, a fairly robust, no, not fairly, a robust evidence-based uh, mental health care system that not only is delivered uh, within the Canadian Armed Forces, but extends into the civilian sector. So I can certainly tell you um, within the last 20 years of my career, there's been massive advancements and mental health injuries are injuries. And so I think we're far better uh, prepared to manage those now than we were in the past. And again, having senior leaders speak out and say, um, I know that you're not doing okay. I know you need to get help. What can I do to get you there? Changing our leadership approach and speaking about it openly has certainly helped get rid of some of those barriers and self-stigma that comes with mental illness. I want to ask Marie-Andre, um, if, if you've got tips based on your experience and, and based on what Rebecca's just said, that, that in that toolkit, were there things, are there things for families? Well, the first, you know, the first thing that really um, stuck to me was, you know, I was not 
going to. I'm a very stubborn person and I was not going to let PTSD define our family and define my life. Um, so we, um, you know, take, we surround ourselves with people that could actually help us and support us and support me when I was alone with the children, um, when he was not able to either physically or mentally not help me with do all the tasks that a house needs to be done, right? So, um, and then it was taking time for me. And, and um, for me, it was hiking. I, I just like being outside in the woods alone, um, just to take the fresh air and just to, you know, disconnect my, my, my wires just for an hour or so. Um, it was also to uh, mind myself that it was okay if the kids were with daddy for an hour or so. And if it's okay, if they eat craft dinner for one day, they're not going to die from it. Um, you know, we set ourselves bars so high sometimes that that's how we fail is that we just, you know, we expect things out of life. And I think that the moment that I was able to say myself, well, you know, it's, it's only a day and tomorrow is something else. Um, for me, it was, uh, it was groundbreaking. I, I surrounded myself with, you know, most amazing friends. Also, these women's from caregiver brigade are like my sisters. Now we do live the same, same kind of things, uh, different deployments, different husband, but most likely diff same, same scenarios at home. Um, and we're there to support each other when, when things go rough, because we understand each other. We you don't get to face the, well, why isn't your husband out of bed yet? You know, it's, it's the, well, he's not doing well today and this is going on and they, they understand it because they've been through the same things. Um, these were, you know, the, the best things that we could, you know, do for ourselves. Uh, it was also to explain to the children what daddy went through and to explain, um, mm. how they could help. Uh, for them, it was, uh, you know, when, uh, when we came back from the Invictus Games, my 11-year-old um, was six years old at the time, and, and he was asking why, you know, there were so many service dogs for people with mental illness, and he couldn't, you know, understand it. And so I explained to him that they were there to support. And he said, well, mommy, when I was in the plane, you know, with daddy who was scared and I held his hand, it was like his service human, right? And I said, yeah, that's what, that's what your job is. So he's, yeah. wow. <laughs> uh, yes, and, I'm all, uh, I'm all choked up now. <laughs> wait until I tell you the story. I went to Disney with two kids. So <laughs> it was, uh, but it was, um, you know, it's, it's now they understand and they understand the importance of daddy sleeping and, and why we, you know, we lead him, we let him alone sometimes and it's fine. We do stuff on our own, but it's, it's teaching them, you know, how to do these things that uh, made us, made our lives much more easier on our mental health. Mm. But you know, once you ungrasp yourself from this is so awful, then for us, it was, okay, well, it's PTSD. You're not doing well today. Okay, screw it. That tomorrow's another day. Anyway, so, you know, when you de-dramatize it, it's much more easier. That's a great, great advice. And, and uh, Marianne, I want to ask you if, if you can give us some insight into, if you could tell your 20-year-old self what you know now, what would you have how would you have conducted your military career or would you have conducted it differently? You know, I, I, it's funny because I think I've asked myself that a few times, like what would I have done anything differently? Um, certainly, uh, I think in terms of uh, adjustment and coping, I think I probably would have liked to have been able to recognize the signs and the symptoms of what I was going through and, and find a way to, to address it before it became a problem, like that recognition. Um, Cause I certainly, it, like I said, it didn't occur to me that I could, I was going to get PTSD or that I could get PTSD. I had spent years, you know, you know, perfecting my craft or, or so I believed as a critical care trauma nurse. And, and I didn't think this was going to happen to me. And so if I could go back, I'd like to probably be more aware uh, but I wouldn't change a thing uh, career wise because it's all led me to where I am now. And I love what I'm doing and I love my role and I, and I'm so happy with my life that I have now. And I, I think that, you know, I've been able to find the positives and the lessons and the meaning behind every challenge that I faced and, and every hurdle that I had to cross to get to where I am today. And so if, if walking that path then is what got me to here, I'd walk it 10 times over again. Mm -hmm. You know, you just talk about it, your life today, and it's pretty rare that we get to speak to somebody 
who is in what clearly behind you looks like you're in some kind of a hospital or clinic. Tell us, if you can, your role today, where you are, why you're there, and how it, it's almost a result of your experience. Uh, yeah, so uh, right now I'm working, I'm in a little town called Iglulik, uh, Nunavut, population about 1500 people. We are uh, not the most northern community in Nunavut, but we're pretty far up there. Um, I started working up here about a year ago. Um, I really wanted to work with First Nations and Inuit, uh, you know, people of Canada. I was really passionate about, you know, working in, in these remote communities. Based on my experiences through the military, you know, we we learn to, we call it MacGyver nursing and you work in these uh, resource limited environments. And uh, it's just something I've always been really passionate about. And it's let me, all of that experience, you know, my 20 years in the military really has benefited me now working up here. So I work here uh, casually as a nurse practitioner. I'm in and out of the communities and I've been to four communities up here now in the last year. And I also work in British Columbia in a urgent primary care clinic in Vernon, British Columbia, where I live now. And we're the COVID respiratory assessment center for the town of Vernon. And we do a lot of care for our homeless opioid addicted uh, kind of marginalized populations. And again, I, based on my military time, really enjoyed the care we provided to, you know, the, the people in Afghanistan and some of my interactions with the people in Bosnia and, you know, when I joined the military, when I look back, you know, it was to help people in need. And it's, I'm really blessed to be able to provide care in these two different places in Canada that provide, that look after the truly, you know, less for, some of them are less fortunate than most of us. Although uh, it's amazing what you learn from each of these communities and each of these places up here. It's uh, funny it's because a, I, the true I, Canadian I, experience. It is. And I would think, just think as you were talking, I was thinking about the interview I did with Nicola, um, and, and she talked about that. The whole goal was to be in Afghanistan to try to help people, to help the children, to help specifically the young women of Afghanistan. And the mission really was singularly focused. Take out the Taliban so we can free the children and free the, the women. And, and I think that, um, you know, what you have now turned this into really is a gift to to so many, to all of us, really. And, uh, and I, I've got a question here from Jody in Ottawa, and I want to direct it to you, Rebecca. Um, she asks, as you grew up, as you grew in your career through the Canadian forces, I'm assuming Jody is a female, actually, it may not be. But anyway, as you grew in your career through the Canadian forces, did you come up against resistance? And how did this impact you and your mental health? I, uh, I, I think um, the question is probably referring to my gender. As a woman, did I um, meet resistance because of my gender? I think I can say that uh, as I joined as a nurse and within Canadian Forces Health Services, we're actually about 50-50 men and women. And uh, so I'm not sure so much that my gender per se was the challenge. I think that um, the challenge was uh, that I will happily say or don't exist now is um, kind of the invisible barrier of being a woman in my reproductive years, especially in the early 2000s, trying to work in a system that was, uh, um, didn't have space to do things that I would normally do in, in my life, have a family and, and balance it with a career. And it wasn't intentional, it was sort of an invisible barrier. So why did that become a challenge? It kind of uh, really came to a head in the early 2000s where um, I was actually in Nova Scotia and I had a small child and a second small child and I was uh, you know, in a senior leadership position. And um, I started to try and meet every need that was out there. Mm. The best leading officer that I was, the best mother juggling daycare, uh, married service couple and living up to expectations of being a first of so even though I was a woman, I tended to be the first 
non-physician to do a certain like a commanding officer, for example, of a large health center in Halifax. I was the first non-physician to do that. And the expectations and the scrutiny um, that I felt that I was under were quite a challenge. And I think that's probably the first time after two deployments at that point, I started to feel little cracks uh, um, metaphorically appear in, in, in my psyche. And remember, I work in healthcare. Um, so what did I do to overcome that? So I would have to say in retrospect, maybe I didn't overcome it, but I think it was the first steps um, by actually seeking help, um, allowing myself to actually seek care. And I, I remember I was in a health center, so there's a little bit of irony there. And, uh, and, and I remember my husband saying to me, we can get a house cleaner, it's okay. Because you know, you want to be perfect in everything you do. And so it sounds like a very crazy thing, but I think a lot of what I was trying to uh, work against was, of course, my own expectations professionally and as a mother, but also uh, systemic pieces that say, if you don't do this, it's uh, too bad, so sad, moving on. Uh, it's you're not good enough in your career. Now I can tell you, we've made massive progress since then. But um, for me, um, I, I do believe I did overcome that and I came out of it stronger. And uh, yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a challenge, but um, pleased to say uh, in 2020, we have made progress in this domain. We've recognized that we have the uh, gender-based analysis thing so we can, we can build these aspects in for men and women who need to have something on their, their private life put aside. You know, it's so great for you. Sharing that kind of a story it helps everybody, I think, um, put it all in perspective. And Marianne, I want to bring you in on this because if you would be comfortable sharing with us where you saw those cracks in your veneer and how, you know, they say everybody has to hit the curb before things turn around. What was your curb? Um, uh, for myself, you know, I had, I had come home in 2008 and uh, knew that I was having issues just based on like triggers that I was having, like nightmares and flashbacks and, and those kind of things. I, um, but I, and I started counseling right away, but I really think I was paying lip service to it. And I, you know, when I look back on it now, I was acting out and I wasn't, you know, being the professional that I had been known to be. Um, and my home life was starting to fall apart. And I went through, uh, you know, I ended up getting uh, posted to Germany and, and just kind of fell apart. I lost kind of my circle of support and, and felt really kind of unsupported by the, by the military. Um, what is and I kind of hit rock apart, bottom when what, I was there. What does falling apart look like you're alone in Germany? Um, I, well, for myself, I was like lots of inappropriate coping mechanisms. So I was, you know, drinking uh, a lot more than I normally would have. Um, I was spending money that I didn't have. I was, you know, I had, you know, angry outbursts. I was very toxic as a person to be around. I was very negative, um, you know, just kind of poor life making poor life choices at that time and, and things that weren't really characteristic for me. If you had known me even say a couple years earlier, but these had all been things that had started to kind of starting to occur in my life. And I was making excuses as to why I was doing them. Um, and just all of a sudden kind of hit rock bottom. And actually it was my chain of command in Germany that said, you know, we, we know you and this isn't you and, and you're, we don't think you're doing very well. And so they made a decision to bring me home from Germany early and it probably saved my life. And I've actually gone back and talked to my commanding officer it was a fellow nurse that I knew uh, what I knew um, the commander way back when, when I was a young baby nurse and she, <laughs> you know, was very compassionate to me and said, you know, I'm worried about you. And I, and I don't, you know, this isn't you and there's something going on. And I was very resistant and I'm a very stubborn and strong bullheaded barber woman. And I, I wasn't recognizing what was going on in my life at the time. And uh, they brought me home back from Germany and I went to Ottawa and I went into like full-time counseling and it wasn't until I was there that, I really was like, holy cow, like, this isn't me. And this isn't my life. And mm -hmm. I also, like Mary Andre said, I, I got to this point where I said, I am not going to let PTSD win. And I'm not going to let this define my life and my career. I worked so hard 
to have the professional reputation that I had and to, and to gain this knowledge and to, I was very passionate about what I was doing. And all of a sudden I was just throwing it out the window, like it was a sack of garbage. And, um, you know, I was really lucky that I had the support from my chain of command and my family, uh, my parents, my siblings were incredible and helpful and they tolerated me through all of the stuff I went through, my friends, you know, I, I lost friends, I gained new friends. Um, and I was really uh, supported to heal. And I eventually did. But at that moment, you know, I, somebody, one of my friends explained it that I kind of went nuclear, uh, which is fitting for me and my personality. In a military so. term, I'm not sure we want to uh, <laughs> go that way. But <laughs> no, no. I'm going to ask you not. though, because Listen, a lot of people don't have that kind of close family and close friends. So I, I wonder what role a charitable organization like True Patriot Love um, can play along with the Canadian Armed Forces to help foster resiliency. For sure. So True Patriot Love, um, you know, plays this really important role for us, as, especially as veterans or as ill or injured soldiers you know, you're facing release or you have been released from the military and the military is your family. It's this community that, you know, you really become attached to, it becomes part of your personal fabric. And then you're starting to get disconnected from it or you are disconnected from it. And True Patriot Love, you know, really shows us that as Canadians, there's this other group of Canadians that's not in the military that actually really cares. And they, you know, they show you that they value you and they have all these incredible programs that they sponsor and, you know, through donating, uh, and I hope people will consider donating to their cause, especially to the Captain Nicola Goddard Fund, because they specifically support programs that are related to service women, uh, vet, um, veteran women, and of course the families, which is such a huge, huge role in all soldiers care. And True Patriot Love really gives you this umbrella of protection that is, you know, you're, you're happy to have, um, and they, and all their programs like Project Trauma Support, the Invictus Games, you know, they help you get your identity back. They give you purpose. They help, um, you know, get yourself back to being normal again. And you, and you're surrounded by this group of people that really, truly care, which is amazing. And they, you know, they have family assistance and they enable rehabilitation. And I know they were a huge part of me transitioning out. I did one of their expeditions in, uh, in 2017 and I got linked up to this community and I have uh, loved every second of being involved with them since. Oh, that's great. It's so true too. And, and, and whether it's the, the true patriot love or Marie-Andre, you mentioned earlier Invictus Games, which was such a national Olympics for all of us watching our troops uh, compete around the world. It's such a beautiful thing. And, and I wonder if you can help us better understand how you and your family, the impact Invictus Games had on you as a family to get through these challenges. Well, the first, um, you know, we, my husband hit rock bottom in 2013 and it was, it took three years where we were just skimming by and then so I ask, I'm going to interrupt because I asked Marianne what rock bottom looked like for her so can you help us better understand what it looked like in your home well as I explained it was you know the nightmares and night terrors of the association the staying up all night the paranoia that not being able to go gro grocery shopping on your own it was uh, on his own it was it was him being so paranoid. He was a um, close protection officer when he was in Afghanistan. So for mm. him, even a, even a car um, parked on the side of the road needing gas was something that was threatening for him. Um, it was, it was, you know, and then when we went to the doctor, started medication, when, you know, we started to listen, not to his wife, but his nurse wife, he actually got better. Um, but it was just stable. It was just, you know, not, getting more than what he needed to be to do and then came along the Invictus games where um, he was like he was back in the family that was the first thing that was very um, very hard for him to leave the the, the, the CAF is, is to lose all his buddies and his family um, but then he actually got to wear you know Canadian colors again and that, that was something that I was very proud of 
Um, but then he had to face his demons. He didn't have anything anywhere to hide. He had to face his anxiety. And uh, he's, um, he's a sharpshooter. He's, uh, he, he's won uh, medals and trophies in the army for, for you know, doing competitions. And, and he took up archery. Uh, and uh, one of the competition at the ESPN Center in, in Disney was uh, uh, was actually being all his bare back to a black crowd. Like it was just, there was no light. It was only focused on him. And when he figured out that he could actually concentrate and actually go and win a silver medal, um, he was able he was able to say, well, I can apply that to every day in my life. PTSD, yes, I'm scared, but I'm going to be able to focus and do what I need to do. Um, and us as a family, too, you know, I, I think I made everyone laugh when we uh, reviewed all this. But I, you know, I was alone with a three year old and a six year old and I took them to Disney on my own. All four theme parks. Thank you very much. Um, and... You deserve a, a medal for that. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen this when we got to the hotel. Oh, my God. And I had gotten up at four o'clock in the morning with two kids that I hadn't slept all day. It was horrible. But anyways, I made it. And uh, but it was, uh, you know, I, I've learned through this that if I'm able to go to Disney with two kids under the age of, of 10, on my own, I can do anything. And, and now I take them, you know, my husband doesn't like flying. He doesn't like to, to travel. It triggers too much and it's okay. But I, because I decided that PTSD was not going to just define us, I want the kids to still have some experiences and I take them everywhere. I took them, you know, I travel with them, take the plane along with them and, and, and you know, make them see other things. Um, that's very important to me. And uh, I think that's what the Invictus Games uh, made us see we met a lot of families too that are going through the same thing than us um, and it was you know it was very eye-opening for the children too to see all these veterans with you know injuries and asking what had happened and and they're pretty open about their injuries so they you know they could ask you know we just figure out what a six-year-old needs to to know and to in process in his brain when he sees someone with a you know we called it the robot legs and still this day that's how mm -hmm. he calls them but it's it's um you know, it was a very big eye opener for us. Um, we actually did two. Um, the second turnaround was in Toronto uh, and he was actually a mentor. So wow. it, it, it made him realize that he can actually help others do that. Um, and it made him realize also that he has limits. So, you know, when it becomes too much, he tends to, okay, that's too much for me. And then he backs off a bit. So he, he learned how to gauge his PTSD reaction too. So it was pretty cool. You know, I liked it. That's it was fun. Sure. I, yeah. I mean, we've always said that for soldiers who come back uh, with physical injuries that the rest of the community can see, it's actually easier to be mm -hmm. open. But when yep. it's PTSD, it's so difficult. Nobody sees that part. No. And, and Rebecca, I, we, we have a question here from Roland, Roland, Roland in Ontario. He asks, how do you believe we can build more mental health resilience in our soldiers during service in preparation for their post-service life? So let's look forward. I think that's a, it's a really topical question and well done for asking that. So to begin with, I mean, I think that resiliency is a career long and a lifelong endeavor. I know there was a nature or nurture type question as well. I think we always have to build and develop our own personal mental resiliency and toughness. So I think that uh, participating in these programs, uh, watching how you live, understanding what Maryam was referring to when your lifestyle choices uh, are falling off the rails, seeking help before you get to the point when you need to transition. And I think that's the next point. Looking forward is um, part of resiliency is knowing what's coming next and feeling in control of that. So having proper transition for people as they move out of the Canadian forces is very critical, whether they move on to um, a, a life um, without specific injuries or through to care to back. And so that definitely is an area that we have put heavy focus on in the, in, in the, in the Canadian Armed Forces right now is trying to make that transition a process rather than 
one day I'm wearing the uniform, the next day I'm not. It's, it's, uh, we know that's very challenging for people. And so um, then finally, even when you've left the Canadian Armed Forces, as all three of us have said, it's that connection, it's that identity and having, whether they be volunteer organizations or social collective groups that you can periodically meet to feel like you, you still belong to, or you're still connected to that sense of identity, I also believe is another way of developing and, and uh, maintaining the resilience that you need. So, so many interesting points in there. And Marianne, I saw you raise your hand at the point where one day you're in a uniform and the next day you're not. But what, what was it in what Rebecca just said that you'd like to add to? I think it's really important, uh, you know, something I didn't recognize in myself and, um, until I was kind of in the process and, and I was about six months out from being released and then probably about six months after the release is the grief that comes from, you know, being getting out of the military. I had to grieve, you know, this mm -hmm. loss of the loss of my old life and my old identity as, you know, Captain Marianne Barber uh, in the Canadian Forces. And then I had to you know, grieve what, you know, this family and this community, because it's certainly the military, I liken it to a really fast moving train and you get off the train and the tracks are still there, but the train's gone. And I have lots of friends and I have a great, you know, relationships with all of my friends who are still serving in the military, but their lives are very busy. And my life is very busy too. But we need to foster this, uh, this, this conversation about this grieving process. You have to learn to find a new identity and love that new identity that is the veteran and we don't really talk about it. And I think it's something that really, you know, sometimes gets a bit missed. And it also, I think we also need to foster our, our, our connection to our local communities. We move around every couple of years. And so you never really get connected into the community that you're a part of. But I think as veterans, we have so much to offer our local communities. And I think it's really important that, you know, we, we foster a way of getting connected, you know, in, in a place where we settle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are getting, sadly, we're getting so close to the end of our conversation, but so I want to hear some final thoughts. And Marie-Andre, I want to ask you, through the prism of this pandemic, um, can you give us some perspective on the topic of, of, of resiliency and managing adversity moving forward? Not everybody who is watching today is... Uh, soldier, retired soldier, but there are probably a lot of family members. So what can you share with us as we look forward? Oh, you know, my, my philosophy out of all of this is, um, you know, just take it one day at a time, one bite at a time. I always say, you know, to my patients when I practice, I, I always say, um, you know, what, what happens when you try to, to woof too much food in your mouth, you choke when, you know, that's what you want to do. You just want to take it slowly and, and not um, try to, to, you know, grasp everything at the same time. Um, and that's what we go by here. Um, you know, we don't, we don't try to put extra and we just limit our energy towards what needs to be done. Um, at some point, you know, COVID is going to go away and the, the, you know, the anxiety is going to go away. Um, but, you know, us, you know, I'm, I'm the soldier now. It's funny enough. I'm the one that goes fighting every day and uh, he's the one that stays home um, and, and we're fine with that. So it's, uh, you know, that's how we've adapted. And, and he's the one that's cheering for me when I was the one cheering for him when he was in Afghanistan. It's the same, same, oh. same thing. So I think that, I get, you know, we, we support each other throughout all this. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we're there for each other to, you know, to try to calm each other down when I'm like having my panic attack because this is way too much. <laughs> um, he's the one that's able to calm me. Yeah. So it's, I think it's one day at a time. There's nothing else we can do about it anyways. It's, it's going to be there. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, let me ask you the same question. So many Canadians right now are actually suffering some kind of form of certainly anxiety with the pandemic. Based on your experience and your knowledge, what advice do you give? I think it's uh, advice that's kind of analogous to the air, air, airplane security briefings. Put your mask on yourself first, then help others. And so being true to yourself, like know and accept your limitations in this mm. pandemic and how you're feeling. And then as you start moving on to help others, 
be kind, be supportive, understand that these are abnormal times and abnormal things that we're, we're living through. Be there to support, seek support, connect regularly. So many methods of doing that now that didn't exist when I first joined. And um, I, I think you have to find the value in your day-to-day -day life. What is your lived experience and what value do you find in that? That's kind of uh, at the heart of resilience from my perspective. And lastly, protect your health. Healthy people are more resilient. Wash your hands, wear a mask, socially distance, and watch social gatherings over Thanksgiving is what I would say. But all in all, it really is uh, be true to yourself and know what your limitations are. And Marianne, we have literally 20 seconds for you. I feel like I'm doing a broadcast here, but I know we're hitting the time. Last words moving forward for the viewers and for everyone listening. I think it's really important to know that, you know, you're not alone. Resiliency is about, you know, you know, believing that you can cope. And we believe that we could cope when we're surrounded by, you know, people who support us and, and then in turn helping others, you know, find the positives in the negatives. I know that's really hard to do. It's easy to focus on the negative, but find the positive, find the meaning and you're not alone and it's okay to not be okay. We're all in this together. And uh, if you think you're suffering with something, there's a, there are lots of ways to reach out and get the help that you need because there are lots of us who are able to help um, now. So this, this has just been so incredibly valuable. And I wanna thank you, Rear Admiral Re Rebecca Patterson, Captain Marianne Barber and Marie-Andre Manette for, for joining us today, your honesty, your openness. I, I know that you've helped people today and a conversation inspired by uh, Nicola Goddard. It means so much to all of us, to so many. And, and I also wanna thank all of our audience members at home for being part of this discussion today and, and submitting your questions. I tried to weave them all in because I realized we couldn't get them all individually in, but thank you so much. Uh, I hope you found this conversation inspiring and engaging and it is the year of the nurse and I salute you three <laughs> fabulous women and I thank you so much and, and I wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving whatever it is going to look like in the year 2020 so thank you all thank you <laughs>